Red Dead Redemption 2's story missions provided a fantastic exploration of life in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and this exploration is only continuing through the game's extensive and interesting stranger missions. And with a few more strangers left to meet, there's even more historical connections to make. So let's take a look at the real history of Red Dead Redemption 2. In Saint Denis, Arthur meets a professor. Professor Marco Dragic. <laughs> Dragic is almost certainly based on Nikola Tesla, who was around 43 years old in 1899. Interestingly, Tesla's family name, some centuries before his birth, was Dragonich, which is strikingly similar to Dragic. Beyond this, the two have similar appearances and are both inventors working with electricity. Both are European. Tesla was Serbian. Dragic is from the Balkans, likely also Serbia. Both emigrated to the United States, Tesla in 1884. Dragic complains about an American. They won the silver tongue American betrayed and not paid the money to. Tesla had similar problems with Thomas Edison and his company doing the same. Both Dragic and Tesla had problems with investors choosing not to invest or outright abandoning them. Dragic's Dover Hill also looks and seemingly functions just like Tesla's Warden Cliff Tower built in 1901. While Dragic is killed by his own creation during the events of the game though, Tesla died in 1943 at the age of 86. Oh, it's a toy boat! Yes, it is a toy boat that I can power remotely using electricity in waves you cannot see! This is likely a reference to Tesla's Telautomaton, a radio-controlled boat that he demonstrated at Madison Square Garden in 1898 and in Chicago in 1899. When he tried to sell the idea as a radio-controlled torpedo, the US military showed little interest in it, so not totally dissimilar to Dragic's rejection in the game. Think of those poor boys on the HL Hunley. Eight of them perished to a mere five on the Housatonic. This is a reference to the Confederate submarine, the HL Hunley, whose first and only enemy attack was against the Navy's USS Housatonic in February 1864. The Hunley rammed a torpedo into the hull of the Housatonic, who sunk within three minutes with five crewmen. The Hunley and its eight crewmen went missing, not to be discovered until 1976, verified in 1995, and raised in 2000. The steam train, the telegraph machine, the motor car, they will all seem pedestrian in comparison to this technology. These were, of course, all in operation by this time, the first commercially successful steam locomotive in 1812, first working telegraph in 1816, and first practical modern automobile in 1885. He lives! My son lives! <laughs> Dragic's son is an automaton, a self-operating machine, which have existed for centuries, the word itself being first used by Homer around the 8th century BC. Perhaps the first to use electricity was the Televox, the Electrical Man, whose patent was filed in 1927. The first to move similarly to Dragic's robot seems to be Electro, who could walk by voice command. He could also speak around 700 words using a record player, blow up balloons, and smoke cigarettes. And he was often accompanied by a robot dog, Sparko, who could similarly move around, wag its tail, and bark. Despite being ahead of his time with his automaton, it seems Dragic unfortunately did not have plans for the companion robot dog. Elsewhere in Saint Denis, Arthur meets another professor, this one asking for some moonshine. Well, as luck would have it, you are in the legal hooch capital of America. The word hooch is said to have originated from a group of indigenous Alaskan people, the Hootsnuwu, or Hoochinu, who distilled their own liquor. American trappers and traders knew the drink to be called Hoochinu or hooch the word first being published in 1897, a few years before the game. By the early 20th century, the word hooch was used for any improvised spirits, like Arthur's usage here. As for being the country's legal hooch capital, New Orleans, the real life equivalent of Saint Denis, was apparently dubbed the liquor capital of America during Prohibition some decades later. This wasn't quite legal hooch at the time, of course, but it seems the capital nickname being applied to Saint Denis is likely accurate as well. After Arthur obtains some moonshine, the professor reveals that he intends to use it for a new invention. The electric chair. In real life, the electric chair was invented by Alfred P. Southwick, a dentist from New York. 
In the early 1880s, he advocated that electricity was a more humane method for executing humans than hangings. His early designs used a modified version of a dental chair. The first person to be executed by electric chair was William Kemmler in New York in 1890, so a little earlier than the game, but still roughly the same time period. Like the execution in the game, Kemmler's execution did not go well. It apparently took two attempts to kill him, and the impacts on his body were unpleasant, to say the least. The electric chair was later adopted in other states, and became prevalent in the country. The professor's patent document, which can be found on his body, matches the formatting of real patent documents with the date, witnesses, and model number, though the professor's model number is very different from the one on the real-life pattern of the electrocution chair. Further northwest in New Hanover, Arthur meets a paleontologist named Deborah McGuinness. She might be partly inspired by Mary Anning, an English paleontologist and fossil collector. Firstly, her clothing colour matches a known portrait of Anning. Like McGuinness, Anning was also overlooked and uncredited. She was ineligible to attend university or join the Geological Society of London and struggled financially for most of her life. That being said, Anning's work was uncredited and overlooked because she was a woman in the 1800s. This may be partly the case with McGuinness, of course, but I suspect there may have been other reasons as well. Are you quite certain you're not a spy? Interestingly, there were similar accusations by paleontologists of having spies sent to disrupt their work around this time. It was known as the Bone Wars, wherein two paleontologists, Edward Cope and Othniel Marsh, consistently attempted to outdo each other, using theft, bribery, and destruction of bones to do so. This mostly took place in the 1870s to 1890s. Cope died in 1897, and Marsh in 1899. Here. Just as I thought. Totalosaurus West, Elizabethus. Like this one, several early paleontology discoveries were incorrect, usually based on assumptions of few fossils. For example, early Megalosaurus reconstructions presented it as a quadruped, whereas modern reconstructions depict it as a biped. Similarly, early Iguanodon restorations are inaccurate, depicting a horn which was later discovered to be a thumb. Sadly, I think Totalosaurus West Elizabethus can be added to this list. In one of the game's most cryptic missions, Arthur meets a man named Francis. Well, what's eating you, partner? Eating me? Well, I'm sorry, I'll dry up. If this accent sounds out of place in Red Dead Redemption 2, well, there's a reason for that. This is a mid-Atlantic or transatlantic accent, a blend of American and the British RP accents, it's typically associated with the entertainment industry, film, television, and radio, and therefore the American upper class. Some well-known speakers include Catherine Hepburn and President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Interestingly, it's a purely learned accent. It's said that no Americans actually spoke it unless educated to do so. It was mostly used in the 1930s and 40s, largely fading in the 50s after the Second World War, following some cultural changes in the United States. Another interesting feature of Francis is his clothing, particularly his trousers or pants with a loop for his belt. Around this time, belts were often worn as part of military uniforms during the Civil War and World War I, and sporting uniforms like baseball. But the more distinctive modern belt rose in popularity around the 20th century, the 1920s and 30s. That's not to say that it's impossible in 1899, of course, but perhaps unusual. Hey, can I ask you a strange question? I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but I'm on the level. On the level is an American colloquialism thought to have originated in the late 19th century, so around this time, assumed to originate from Freemasonry, in which the level of a carpenter is thought to symbolize integrity. Eh, I know, it sounds ridiculous, but I'm on the up and up. This phrase has a bit of a mysterious origin. Some date it to 1863, while others say it originated around the 1920s, 30s, or 40s. In any case, certainly an interesting usage here. You'll think I'm jazzed if I tell you. You're what? Drunk. This one also has contested dates, but all seem agreed that it seemingly originated after the game, around 1920, perhaps even 1955. If a lot of these dates appear out of place for the game's setting, well, there's a reason for that too. After Arthur finds all of the rock carvings, he meets Francis again, this time as a one-year-old child, and finds a mural on the wall. Essentially, the mural seems to suggest that Francis might be a time traveller, and the fact that he's a one-year-old child in 1899 suggests that the adult Francis who Arthur met was from the 1920s or 30s. So perhaps some of these apparent inaccuracies aren't so inaccurate after all. 
As for the mural itself, visually it appears to be inspired by Diego Rivera's mural Man, Controller of the Universe from the 1930s, a recreation of his unfinished earlier work Man at the Crossroads. Rivera's mural represents politics, namely socialism and capitalism, whereas the in-game mural mostly appears to represent time travel, showing different stages in history. The original mural was painted in the new RCA building at Rockefeller Center in New York City. After a newspaper called the mural anti-capitalist propaganda, Rivera added a portrait of Vladimir Lenin, the former leader of the Soviet Union. Nelson Rockefeller, the director of the Rockefeller Center, requested the removal of Lenin's portrait, but Rivera declined, and the mural was later destroyed. Rivera recreated it in Mexico on a smaller scale, based on photographs of the original, with some additions. Back in Saint Denis, Arthur catches up with Algernon and Wasp, who tasks him with tracking, among other things, flowers. Based on this information alone, there's a possibility this mission is inspired by the novel Flowers for Algernon, though the comparisons mostly end there. Algernon gives Arthur a cup of tea. Be careful with the china! In this context, China, of course, refers to porcelain. Unsurprisingly, based on its name, porcelain was invented in China. Its quality led to it being known as China or Chinaware. The latter ultimately decreased in usage, but the former clearly did not. It is French. No Belgian. No, 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 no. They are Philistines in that area. This word was certainly accurate around this time, having been a common British term for almost a century. It's essentially referring to someone being uncultured, averse to intellectualism or aesthetics. When Arthur later returns with the requested feathers and flowers, Algernon explains who they are for. You did! Oh, the Duchess of Sorrento will be most happy with you! There's an Italian town by the name of Sorrento. When it was more of an independent state, the Duchy of Sorrento, it had an elected duke, and therefore duchess, around the 7th to 10th centuries. It was, however, annexed by the Normans after their conquest in the 12th century, quite some time before the events of the game. I cannot believe the pressure this woman puts me under. Which woman? The Baroness, of course. She writes the most dreadful missives from Baden-Baden. Baden-Baden is a spa town in southwestern Germany. There are several other places, including in Germany, known as Baden. This one essentially means the town of Baden within the territory of Baden, hence its double usage. The town itself apparently got its name formally in 1931, several decades after the game, but the name was used for the territory generally sometime earlier, so it's not inaccurate here. She's asked me to summer with her there next year, but, well, I find the whole thing a little gaudy. Italy is just so overrun with Americans just now, don't you find? Yeah, it's a real problem. Apparently it was considered cheap to be in Italy in the 19th century. One author in 1847 estimated that she could live comfortably in Rome for six months for a total of $400, around $15,000 today. And another author in the 1830s said he was renting lodgings that made him feel like a prince in Florence for $3 a month, a little more than $100 a month today. Several Italians, meanwhile, went the other way. More than a million emigrated to the United States between 1871 and 1900. It was thought that most planned to work for a few years before returning home. And around 46% who entered the US between 1899 and 1924 ultimately returned to Italy permanently. Sometime later, Algernon is quite upset. I want you to kill me! Huh? I, I have a gun! <clears throat> Got a gun. These are Tahitian pearls. Oh, Tahiti? Tahitian pearls, cultivated of course in French Polynesia, including Tahiti, are known for their beauty and highly sought after. Oysters in the region were harvested to the point of near extinction until around the 1960s, before regulations were implemented. In the 1970s, American jeweler Harry Winston was struck by the beauty of the pearl and was able to sell a strand, for quite a price, within a week. The jewels were perhaps less sought after in the United States in 1899, but no less beautiful, really, so Algernon's interest in them is entirely unsurprising. A little further south in Saint Denis, Arthur meets an artist in a mission titled The Artist's Way. Interestingly, this is also the name of a self-help book about artistic inspiration and creative recovery, written by Julia Cameron and published in 1992. Whether or not the mission's name was based on the book title is difficult to say, but it's an interesting comparison nonetheless. 
The artist Arthur Meats, Charles Chatenay, is likely inspired by the French artist Paul Gauguin, who was 51 years old in 1899 and died four years later at the age of 54. Like Chatenay, Gauguin painted nude women, likely deemed scandalous at the time, though he and his works are considered more controversial now considering his sexual relations with young girls and the fact that his work reflects his patriarchal colonialist position. Chatenay says that he left Paris for Saint-Denis, and at the end of this mission he leaves Saint-Denis for the South Pacific. Gauguin's travels were similar, leaving France for several places, but eventually Tahiti and the Marquesas Islands in French Polynesia, where he died. A lot of Chatenay's work bears a striking resemblance to Gauguin's as well, in subject and art style. Buy me a drink, mon ami. Two brandies, bud. It's two dollars a glass. About a hundred years before this, in Natchez and New Orleans, peach brandy cost around $1 to $1.15 per gallon. By the late 1890s, some brandies cost $2 per gallon in Louisiana and $3 per gallon in Virginia. So at $2 per glass, this brandy is either very overpriced, or as the bartender claims, very good. It's the best. You pay. Not according to salons at Paris. Today, salon generally refers to beauty salons, which actually began to pop up around the United States around this time. Chatenay, though, is more likely referring to a type of gathering known as a salon, which became regular around the 1730s in France. There was also an art exhibition known as the Salon in Paris, which started in 1667 and became prominent in the 18th and 19th centuries, featuring dozens of painters, sculptors, and engravers, among other professions. As Chatenay suggests, its jury often rejected paintings. In 1863, there was a failure rate of almost 60%, so Chatenay was not alone in this, at least. Here. What is it? Uh, it's just a little doodle. Interestingly, the word doodle has meant several different things over the years. In the 17th century, a fool or simpleton. In the 18th, to ridicule or make a fool of. In the 19th, to do nothing. The meaning of an aimless scrawl apparently originates in 1937, quite some time after Chatenay's usage here, but he's nothing if not ahead of his time, if his art is any indication. Later in the mission, Arthur visits Chatenay's art exhibition. In addition to Chatenay's work, the gallery houses at least five art pieces from Charles Wilson Peale, and one each from his sons Rembrandt and Rubens Peale, all painted between the 1770s and 1860s. Charles Peale is well known for his portraits, especially of leading American figures. His 1779 portrait of President George Washington sold in 2006 for $21.3 million, thought to have been the highest price ever paid for an American portrait at the time. Like Buddha said, you know, we are all just here to fuck. <gasps> well, that explains the decadence of those Hottentots. This is historically a racial term, typically by Europeans, in reference to the Kwe Kwe, an indigenous people of South Africa. It's generally considered offensive in this context, and was later used as a more generally abusive term, not necessarily related to any particular race or ethnicity. It actually re-entered the cultural conversation recently due to its usage in the 1964 film Mary Poppins, which had its age rating lifted in the UK as a result. Up here, she is my ship. The tradition of using she and her pronouns for a ship dates to at least 1375, apparently based in the idea that a ship is a goddess or mother figure who helped to protect its inhabitants. If they don't like you in the islands, keep on going to the South Pole. Nobody had actually verifiably made it to the South Pole by this point. The first successful expedition was led by Roald Amundsen in a ship who, alongside his crew, arrived in December 1911. Amundsen was also among the first to verifiably reach the North Pole, this time by aircraft, in May 1926. cigarette cards. The value is in completing the set. And the amount of money? <laughs> a veritable fortune, sir. Fortune? Oh, sure, sure. A complete set of any series is worth a fortune. We spoke about cigarette cards back in chapter one, but Phineas here is talking about them as collectibles. At the time, they were mostly used as a way to advertise cigarette brands. And while they may have been worth something at the time, they're definitely worth a lot more now. There are more expensive cards generally, but the most expensive cigarette card is the T206 Honus Wagner, of which approximately 50 to 200 were distributed before Wagner refused for production to continue. In 2022, the card sold for $7.2 million. 
In the game, there are 12 series with 12 cards each. In real life, there are often plenty more within a set, 30, 50, even 100. By collecting every card and sending them to Phineas, Arthur earns a collective total of $1,000, equivalent to more than $37,000 today. The game's only epilogue-exclusive Stranger mission is led by Evelyn Miller, who we met in Chapter 4 and discussed even earlier in Chapter 2. To reiterate, it seems highly likely that Miller is inspired by the American philosopher and essayist Henry David Thoreau. They have similar appearances. Thoreau had different beard lengths throughout his life, but in one famous photograph he has a similar beard to Miller, albeit longer. They also have similar interests, like education. Thoreau taught at a school in Massachusetts and opened a grammar school with his brother in the 1830s, while Miller was a professor at Princeton University. They both discuss and advocate for nature, neither of them truly rejecting civilization nor bringing themselves to fully embrace a life of wilderness. And they both lament and resist the overrule of governments. Thoreau famously in his resistance to civil government, written in part because of his disgust by slavery and the Mexican-American War, and Miller as shown in Chapter 4 when he advocates on behalf of Rain's fall and eagle flies. In this mission, Miller discusses how he quit Princeton to live in an isolated cabin and tall trees to work. Thoreau did something similar for two years in the mid-1840s, moving to a small house he had built near Walden Pond, leading to one of his best-known works, Walden. As for Evelyn Miller's name, it could be completely random of course, but if it was inspired by anyone, a likely candidate might be Ernest Hemingway, whose middle name was Miller. While not exactly an isolated cabin in the woods, Hemingway did buy a house outside of Ketchum, Idaho in 1959, overlooking Big Wood River. He died there two years later, in 1961. In the second part of this mission, Miller takes us to see some hunters. Not Bigfoot, much to our disappointment. Interestingly, many different cultures, perhaps most, have some folk tales of a human-like giant or a Sasquatch in their history. The name Bigfoot, though, was apparently first used in 1958, after a bulldozer operator for a logging company in California discovered mud footprints that were 16 inches, or 40 centimetres, long, a claim that was apparently corroborated by his co-workers. At the end of this mission, you find Miller dead in his cabin, slumped over his work. So you burn down the cabin. While his body likely burned, there's a good chance that his death was eventually discovered, assuming there were records of the cabin. That being said, there are several examples of famous authors disappearing throughout history, like Ambrose Bierce, an influential journalist and Civil War veteran, who was last heard from on December 26, 1913, at the age of 71, before vanishing without a trace. Barbara Newhall Follett, a child prodigy novelist, reportedly left her apartment on December 7, 1939, at the age of 25, after quarrelling with her husband, and was never seen again. Weldon Keyes, who had apparently had episodes of manic depression, was last heard from on July 18, 1955, at the age of 41, and his car was found near the Golden Gate Bridge. So while Miller's death was perhaps under different circumstances than many other famous authors, it's not uncharacteristic for one to get entirely lost in their work, or for the work to overcome them entirely. Red Dead Redemption 2's 100 plus story missions and dozens of stranger missions have allowed a unique and interesting look at the history of the late 19th and early 20th centuries and beyond, from the lives of individuals to the development of nations. Using the words, actions and objects of the game world provides a useful jumping off point to discuss so many different elements of history, not just to determine the historical accuracies or inaccuracies present within the game, but to explore history more broadly and discover what happened in the past to shape the lives we live today. But while the missions of Red Dead Redemption 2 may be over, our journeys with history are most certainly not. There are so many more games to play, in this series and beyond, more individual aspects to discuss, and most importantly, and most obviously, more history to uncover. <laughs>